Hi ladies and gents, my name is Tom Gibson and in this video we were talking about how to give a math test during distance learning. So the big question is how do I keep kids from cheating on my math test that I give them while they are at home taking these tests? And the thing is you cannot keep them from cheating. Even if you use software that did not allow them to open up any other apps, they can always just pull out their phone uh, and look something up if they need to without actually changing out of the tab that is on their computer. You could also add a time limit, but again, if a student wants to cheat, they could just pull out their phone uh, and look something up or use a certain calculator uh, that will show them how to solve the problem. So before one of my first tests that I gave students, I actually acknowledged this and I actually recorded the conversation so you could hear what that sounded like as I appealed to the student's sense of integrity and to the honor system. Um, with this test, uh, my request of you is for you to complete it uh, without the use of any supplemental materials, um, without researching anything or using your notes. Um, a calculator is fine, you don't really need it, uh, but if you want to use a calculator, that's okay. Um, without getting any help from anybody else, because I want to see what you know. Uh, after going through this lesson, what, what do you know um, about about un this unit. Um, obviously there's no way for me to enforce this or to regulate this, because even if I had like the most advanced software that didn't even let you open up any tabs or anything like that, there's always like your cell phone or something like that. And so really this is based on the honor system um, and having integrity. Uh, and so my request uh, is that you complete it uh, based on what you know um, as you're going into, into the test. But outside of hoping that students won't cheat on a test, there are ways that you can assess students so that you can actually see what they know when it comes to the math content. I am a big fan of students explaining what they know, explaining why a certain answer is the way that it is. Sometimes I will even come out and just say, this is the answer to this question explain why it's the answer. I've done this in the past with mixed fractions, like one and two thirds plus negative three and four fifths equals this. Explain how someone would figure that out. And so that way I can actually see if students are like, oh, first you have to convert it to improper fractions and then you find the common denominator, which is this in this case, and then you get an answer and then you convert that back to the mixed number, which is exactly what the answer was. I know that it's negative because blah, 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 blah. And so given that we are virtual, I like to have the students record video where they're explaining what they know. And so for one of my first tests that I gave this year, it was for my pre-algebra class and it was about addition and subtraction of integers. I decided to use five questions because I didn't want 15 questions and then each question took two or three minutes and then I end up with this really long video for each student that I have to watch. So if you can't boil your test down to five questions, then just give more tests. Instead of waiting to finish three or four lessons and then giving a test, give a test after one or two lessons and then and then boil it all down to five or less questions. Three questions would be even better. Also as a side note, when you're creating these questions, every question doesn't have to be worth the same amount of points. Maybe your first question is like, okay, this is the question that I feel everyone should know. Maybe that's worth the most points. And then the next question is like, okay, I think, I think most students will know this, but I can get why some students may, may have a problem with this. That's worth a few less. And then the question that's like the real challenge question is, is worth, worth the least amount. And the reason I do that is because if there's like a certain basis of content that I'm like, okay, as long as you know this, uh, we can move forward from there, then I think that should be worth the most amount of points. And this gives me a little bit more of the freedom to actually add more challenging questions because even if kids don't get it, it's worth fewer points on their test. So that's something that is that could be applied to whether you're doing in-person or remote testing. And so I have the students walk through their problem. I have them actually either draw out the problem on, on their computer screen or they could do it on paper and then take a picture of it and explain it. I think one of the best apps to do this is a website called Flipgrid. You can create your class where students can join and then you create a page where you can say, okay, you're gonna answer these five questions and then you can even give a sample video of what you are looking for in the videos that they turn in. And Flipgrid typically is something where students can see each other's videos and then leave a video response themselves. But on a test context like this, I keep their responses hidden so I'm the only one that actually sees it. So that way students aren't just watching other people's videos and then just copying off of that. And so once the students turn it all in, there is a nice feature 
feedback and rubric feature in Flipgrid where if it's only five problems, okay, problem one, you can get this many points, problem two, you can get that many points, problem three, and then I can go and add those points and then leave a comment on there that says like, oh, problem one, you didn't take notice of the absolute value symbols that were there. Oh, problem two, problem two, you made a mistake at in the second step of the problem, but after that it looked okay. I could also record my own video response if I would like, but using that feedback feature also just lets them know where they lost points since I can't like mark off on, on their video as easily as I would like a paper pencil test. And what's nice is it creates a link that if they go to, they'll be able to see the feedback that I left for their video. I like that a lot because on my learning management system, I can go ahead and put the grades in there. And then in the comment, I could say, hey, here's your feedback for this test. And they can go on that link and then it'll take them to the actual Flipgrid feedback that I gave them. So a key point with this though, is actually making your own video where you're walking through maybe a really, really simple problem say, okay, this is what I'm looking for in your videos. Here's how, if you wanna draw it on Flipgrid, how you can use the different features on here. Experiment with Flipgrid yourself. So that way if students have a question about it, you have at least have some kind of framework on like, oh, if you just click on filters and then click on grid, it'll show grid paper that you can actually draw on um, and then have them actually create their videos. One little caveat is sometimes students make the videos and then they think they can add little layers to it after they make the videos. Cause like on Instagram and on TikTok and all these other social media platforms, that's what it's like. You record the video and then you can add stickers and text and all that other stuff. With Flipgrid, you need to add all that stuff first then hit record and then it's recording what's on the screen. You can't add it after the fact. So play around with Flipgrid yourself, create an instructional video on what you're looking for, what the expectation is in the student's videos. Use a really simple example as your example in that video. And that way kids know exactly what is being expected of them. I'll link to a video that Sam Carey created for, for students actually on how to use Flipgrid that you could share with your students as well. And it'll also show you how to do it when you're getting started. That has been my favorite way of assessing students in my math classes during distance learning. And so in the description description down below, I'm actually going to put a link to another way that I assess students where I have them do a math blog. It's usually a test grade, but it's not like a test and it's more of just an explanation of what they're doing, showing examples and things like that. Um, I'll leave a link to a rubric that I use for math blogs as well as an alternative to doing some video assessments with your students. So that being said, my name is Tom Gibson. I hope you learned something today that'll help you create a more meaningful and memorable experience for your students, even if you are teaching remotely right now. If if you'd like to stay in the loop with any upcoming videos, go ahead and hit subscribe. Don't forget to check the link down below if you'd like to explore math blogs as an assessment tool in your math classroom. And hopefully I will see you in the next video.